Okay, uh, I, I, I think we are starting. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to see this very nice turnout. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm a professor in computer science. My name is Ur Chetan Temel. Uh, I'm also the uh, current department chair. I've been serving for the last five years. Uh, so we are very excited about this event. Uh, some of you may know that this is also the 14th anniversary of the department, which is very exciting. And I really can't imagine a more meaningful uh, event to celebrate our uh, 14th anniversary. Uh, so when Norm first mentioned this idea to me, I got really excited and I thought that this is something that we really need, need to do this year, uh, which is wonderful. And especially given the long history of hypertext work here in the department and all the seminal work that the department has done and many of you have done. Uh, which is something that we cherish and acknowledge as our, one of our main contributions to the world. Uh, it, it's great, so I'm really excited. So I thought that I have a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about the department. Uh, many of you are alums and friends of the department, and, but some of you may not be following what has been happening recently. Uh, for the last four or five years, uh, especially the undergraduate program has been growing significantly, uh, which is awesome. Uh, so every year we've been adding 10, 15 percent uh, to the enrollments, to the number of concentrators we have. Uh, so this uh, year on Sunday, we're going to be giving out about 250 diplomas. About 39, 40 percent of our graduating class is actually female students, which is awesome. <laughs> so uh, Brown is the top concentrator, most popular concentration at Brown by a large margin uh, for the last couple of years. And the UTA program, I know many of you have UTA, so that program has also grown with growing enrollments. Uh, so in the fall and in the spring, we had about 300 UTAs working for the department. And I would like to thank all of you uh, who actually contributed to the UTA endowment, which we completed last year. Uh, I would like to especially acknowledge Norm Meyerowitz here, who took a big leadership. Thank you, Norm. Uh, so, in response to all these sort of increased interest in computer science, but also acknowledging the importance of computer science as a discipline uh, that empowers all the other disciplines, and that's really critical for a modern universe and modern society, the administration allowed us to grow the department, the faculty, by about 50%. So that's going to happen uh, within the next five years. We are also very excited about that. We started recruiting. Uh, so that's going to help us reduce the size of the classes, uh, improve the uh, student-to-faculty ratio, but also start really exciting multidisciplinary research programs uh, with a focus on societal impact. So all of these things are happening, so you'll hear more communication about all of these things. So coming back to this, I remember Norm sending me an email about this event, I think last December. Uh, I got excited. I asked him three questions. Uh, I said, okay. How long is it going to be? Uh, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> and who's going to do it? So Norm said, uh, it's going to be a low-key event, three hours max. <laughs> and then he said, he's going to find the external sponsor to cover the cost. <laughs> and then he said, and then he will do the organization. Uh, of course, it turns out that what? It's nine hours. The program is nine hours long. Uh, if there are students in the room, I'm sorry to say that we won't be able to get those new machines in the sound lab next fall. <laughs> but his uh, third answer was accurate. In fact, Andy and he did the organization. Uh, each did what they do best. Uh, Andy picked the food, and Norm did the rest. <laughs> and the wine, and the so, wine. Uh, <laughs> so while lots of things have changed at Brown, you would notice that some things remain the same. So HTA still do the professor's work. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Thanks for coming. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, Andy and Norm, uh, but also Lisa Manikowski, who is, I think, outside, who really did an amazing job with the organization. Uh, but it's important, I'd like to thank all of you. I know how much time you spend getting those software and hardware up and running. And of course, this is a big team effort. So I'm really excited to see you know, what you guys have come up with. So I'm going to now turn it to Andy, who's going to introduce Norm. Thanks, Ur. Ur has been the best chairman we've ever had. And I want to thank him for his unwavering support of 
all of our many activities, and this one in particular, he is paying the bills. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> A lot of people have helped with this, but the man of the hour is Norm. So, I'm gonna say that this is a five ring circus, one for each decade, and the ringmaster is Norm, as we all know, in his traditional role of I'll take it on, and then I'll let mission creep dictate what happens next. <laughs> Classic example. He's also an amazing digital archeologist. He went through stuff that people submitted and he had help, Greg Lloyd and others of you pitched in, but he found this amazing stuff that most of us did not know about and engaged in one of the most amazing pieces of digital recovery, restoration, I call it the resurrection, and I'll let him talk about his particular resurrection. We have a second one, which is the, don't give the lines away, all right. You'll see multiple amazing resurrections, but I pronounce Norm as the, the king of resurrection across the spectrum of all the things that could be resurrected. <laughs> and finally, as a sort of catchy title that doesn't quite work, I also think of him as the Houdini of hypertext. Houdini known for his disappearing and reappearing acts, but more, he was a really good magician and his escapes were just part of a much larger spectrum of things that he knew how to do. Norm can do everything, does everything, with great gusto, persistence, chases things down that you didn't even know existed, and I'm so very, very proud of everything he's accomplished. I wanna thank all of you for coming. I wanna thank you for all the years of work that many of you here did, some like Marty, almost two decades on these various crazy projects that you're going to hear about. And uh, this has been, I hope for you, a magnificent way of recreating some memories, restoration of our memories. I really need that badly myself. And uh, we'll now turn the program over to Norm. Thank you so much, Norm. Thank you. Oh, it's the mic's off. I forgot, am I on still? Yep. Very important announcement. Norm, as you know, among all those many roles, was also a superb TA and head TA. And he was the spark plug that started the UTA endowment program. It's 300 UTAs per semester. You might have thought it was per year, per semester. Unbelievable. Anyhow, he's the spark plug that has made it possible. And in his honor, tomorrow there will be a dedication of the Norman Meyerowitz Fishbowl. The Fishbowl is our official name of our major TA room. Karen did the appropriate ah. Can we all do an ah? One, two, three, ah. So he will be forever memorialized as the UTA of UTAs. Well, thank you. Well, that's a surprise. Uh, there we go. Welcome to uh, just um, make you um, not so nervous after Ur's talk. I will not be asking anybody for money <laughs> at any point during this weekend. Um, but, um, how did this start? Well, um, the folks at the Computer Museum, Mark and David, who are here, um, who also happen to be Brown alums, they're the curators of the web and the internet um, collection, asked Andy and me to see if we can get our systems running for a celebration of Doug Engelbart's 50th um, anniversary of his mother of all demos. So um, amazingly enough, um, well, Dave Durand has been building an emulator 
for the IMLAC for Fress, and he and Andy and others, they, they were able to get that working. And then I thought Intermedia was gone because we have had we had hard disks go, but one of our folks, Bern Hahn, had an old Roadshow disk, and we were able to, I was able to find old Mac 2 CIs, old cables, old monitors um, on eBay, and we ran the, um, we attached the disk, Tim, Catlin, and I, and amazingly enough, it booted into Mac OS. When we tried booting into AUX, um, it crashed. And somehow in the back of my mind, I said, I remember something about there being too much memory. So we had to go into the machine and change the 32 megabytes to eight megabytes because of 24-bit addressing. So it's the first time I've had to reduce the amount of memory. <laughs> Um, so, let me start kind of by just doing a level setting. If you look into 50 years ago and you try to plot the growth of computing linearly, it's ridiculous. If you try to do it by powers of 10, the bandwidth has gone up by, um, seven orders of magnitude, the uh, memory has gone up by four orders of magnitude, and I think the CPU and disk is five orders of magnitude, um, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, the, if you think back to 50 years ago, the number of people with the understanding and knowledge of hypertext was less than 100. Uh, you know, if you, that's like the beginning of TV with Philo Farnsworth and Dworkin and Sarnoff. I mean, that's really early because now there are 4.4 billion people who understand hypertext. So that's um, a pretty, that's 3,999,000 something. Uh, so where did this all start? There are pioneers of hypertext. One of them, um, Vanny Var Bush, is the one who's cited. He wrote this article in Atlantic Monthly in 1945, and then it was reprinted in Life magazine in September of 45. Um, it was called As We May Think, and it was a very visionary uh, article. It talked all about how we should have machines that can um, create that can record our information, create associative trails so that people can travel through trails. Um, and the machine looked like that on the left. He talked about a vocoder um, that would do voice recording. There were two multiple monitors down there, multiple screens where you could use a pen to annotate. And um, it was all on microfilm. Paul Kahn has put together uh, they put together a while ago an animation of what that machine might look like. The owner of the Memex, let us say, is interested in the properties of the bow and arrow. The of the he has dozens of possibly pertinent books and articles in his Memex. First he runs through an encyclopedia, finds an interesting but sketchy article, and leaves it projected. Next, in a history, he finds another pertinent item and ties the two together. Thus he goes, building a trail of many items. Occasionally, he inserts a comment of his own, either linking it into the main trail or joining it by a side trail to a particular item. So it's sort of like the internet without ads. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, you know, I've had this magazine um, 
in my office for years and years and years, and I never noticed until I was taking photographs. So he wrote this article originally in 1939 before the war, and then it was published after the war. He was Roosevelt's science advisor. But in 1939, this was pretty visionary because that ad there, <laughs> nylon had not been perfected yet. And so that's an ad for men's sock garters because socks couldn't be held up. So that's kind of a, um, a juxtaposition of how forward looking he was. Doug Engelbart is the second person who's cited as a pioneer. He did a system starting in 1962 um, for augmenting human intellect. He wanted people to actually be in a cockpit of information. He wasn't all about, even though he invented the mouse, which is there on the right, um, it was all about having so much power that you could do anything with information. And NLS had all sorts of things. It had linking, direct manipulation, it had outlining, it had audio and video conferencing, view specs, keywords, I can go on and on forever. But he was an inspiration and he did this demo called the Mother of All Demos that um, was a 90 minute video conference between Menlo Park and um, uh, San Francisco and it turned out it was at a conference that Andy attended and spoke at. This is Bill English who was down in Menlo Park um, at the other end and you can see over there on the slides it says jump to entity, jump to name, jump ahead and return. So these are all the linking things they had in, by 1968. Well, the third pioneer is Ted Nelson. And Ted went to Swarthmore, graduated in 1959. He was a philosophy major. He went off, he took a, a computer course at Harvard and he found them intriguing. So he had read Vannevar Bush's article when he was a kid. Doug Engelbart had also read it when he was stationed somewhere in the Navy. And that was an inspiration. And in 19, 1963 in Miami, Ted said he coined the word hypertext. And this is the first published paper in uh, 1965. And that's the first published use of the word hypertext. Um, and these are some of the drawings in that original paper, and they look like the drawings that we all do of hypertext now. Well, Ted has invented lots of words besides hypertext and hypermedia. All of these words, docuverse, which I think is really important because that was his um, view of what we were trying to create, a, a, a universe of documents. Um, if you want more info, he wrote a great book um, called Computer Lib. Actually, it was two books. If you turned it upside down and turned it around, um, on the other side, you got that book. And then Literary Machines was um, more about, uh, in detail, about the docuverse in Xanadu. And this is my favorite um, coinage and kind of the philosophy of the whole thing. Everything is deeply intertwined. <laughs> so, how did Hyperdex get to Brown, and how did we end up with a fourth pioneer? Um, well, that's not Brown, that's Swarthmore, and not only did Ted go to Swarthmore, but Andy went to Swarthmore. <laughs> and um, he graduated a year after Ted, but he knew Ted from his freshman week. Um, they had a chance meeting at a conference, I believe, in 1967. And uh, Ted told Andy about all of these ideas he had. And Andy said, well, that's really interesting. Um, I have this graphics computer, and I have all these undergraduate and graduate programmers. And I think it would be way more edifying for them to build a system than to sleep at night. <laughs> so that's how hypertext got to Brown. Ted came, Andy came, and many of you um, did not sleep. So it's the early 70s, and I mean the early 60s and um, late 60s and early 70s. 
Um, if you went to school, you might have looked like that. <laughs> um, your calculator looked like that. You know, 1970, the, the pocket calculator didn't really become uh, commercial until 1972. Your word processor, oops, your word processor looked like um, that. Um, your campus computing looked like this. This is just the panel of um, the 360, which took up a room. Um, and that had 512K. So if, you, um, if an elephant steps on your watch and you pick up a piece, it will be more than 512K. <laughs> Um, that was the terminal that you had, um, you know, no screens, it was a selectric typewriter. But given that state, or sorry, state of computing, in the castle, um, stuff was brewing. And so now I'd like to invite Andy and his sleepless crew um, to give the next step. <laughs> So, a little bit about my own background. I got my PhD at University of Pennsylvania, starting off as a hardware engineer and switched after I took my first optional course on digital computers, a word that I had never heard, having graduated with an engineering sciences degree. I know about analog computers, but never heard of digital computers. My office mate talked me into taking this course and I fell in love. Now in this course, we had assignments. They were writing zeros and ones in binary on a piece of paper because the university's only computer, 25,000 people, one computer, was a UNIVAC one, and it was too scarce a resource to be used by mere students, a theme you might hear about <laughs> a little bit later. So we wrote zeros and ones on paper and had the man correct it. Well, that was an interesting environment, but at some point I did get to see the new IBM mainframe that was rolled in, and I was able to get some time on it occasionally. I was at that time very interested in information retrieval. This artifact is a IBM card or punch card with a little piece of microfilm in there, which had terrific storage density, so you could store a lot of engineering drawing on that little piece of microfilm and still use the computer to do Boolean retrieval of keywords. And those of you who did the IR assignment in the early days, that's where that came from. Well, what second thing that changed my life besides that first course was seeing Sketchpad, which again blew me away. Communicating in picture language in real time as opposed to dealing with cards, which was the best medium we had available at that time. This is a box of cards. For those of you interested in souvenirs, I will part with a few precious remains at the end. Uh, I'm moving on a little too fast here. Let me go back here. So I decided to switch from information retrieval to Computer graphics, we didn't have a graphics console, so my thesis actually printed out things on the line printer, with little asterisks and other marks to simulate lines, and that's all we thought about, line graphics in those days. Computer science, just to take you back, wasn't even a thing. Nobody knew what computer science was. It was not a name in common usage, and if people heard it, they said, what? Is that like political science? I eat not a real science. <laughs> and that was the attitude that everybody had to this upstart young field that didn't have departments and didn't have degrees or anything. So that idea of having sort of to fight for our legitimacy continued through the 60s and 70s. And these arguments about what is computer science continued for decades. Now we don't worry about it anymore. Hey, we own the campus. Why do we have to defend <laughs> ourselves? All right, computer science. Uh, computing resources, however, remained scarce. And there was this continual fight for funny money. 
So there was a central administrator who allocated it per course, per person. There was micro accounting that IBM did uh, on their operating system so that you could be billed for the number of disk sectors and bytes that you use, the number of microseconds of computation. Everything was microtoned so that you could get a bill and you had to find money to pay for this stuff somewhere. It was an attempt to try to pay back the monstrous monthly rental fees, which ranged in the tens of thousands of dollars for that computer. So this fight for funny money was very real. I have many stories about it. I'll just tell you one of the ones where I had a big fight to get money for using computers for word processing and hypertext experiments. I had this big fight with somebody named Paul Mader who was in charge of allocating this money. And at one point he said, the computer is for scientists and engineers who have real problems to solve and let the humanities users use typewriters. The equivalent of let them eat cake, in short. <laughs> And then I pointed out to him that in the brochure about the computing center, it said that the computer was a resource for general use. And I said, it wouldn't look very good if there was an article in the BDH or elsewhere <laughs> saying that the computer was for everybody as long as they were in engineering and the sciences. So uh, that's one of the fights I won. Rod Chisholm, a famous professor that Joe Strandberg will mention briefly, got his money. We got money for courses, but it was always a fight. All right, we heard about Ted Nelson. I met Ted at the Spring Joint Computer Conference and we decided, yeah, let's put on a show. I had the garage, I had the equipment, I had the people, he had many of the ideas. A bunch of you were involved. You were all not just schleps, you were idea generators. You were treated as equals most of the time. And I'm very proud of that idea of using undergraduates in research because, again, part of the culture that was absolutely unheard of. I took shit from my colleagues for having undergraduates tromping up and down the halls of applied math of all hours of day and night. And I was told famously, you can't do research with undergraduates. And then we published papers in which one of the very first one, Steve Carmody, was the first author. And that was a pattern that we continued. Well. It had a dual nature. It was both for testing out Ted's hypertext ideas, but I also wanted it for producing documentation so that we didn't have to depend on Selectric typewriters anymore. And it was kind of a constant struggle between the two of us, which set of features would dominate. I want to give a big thank you to Sam Matza, who was the director of the IBM New York Scientific Center whom I told about this project because it was really a bootleg project and I hadn't told him we were doing it until I could show him a demo of it and then he said, wow, that's really great and then he helped me try to sell it to a number of people that I'll mention later. I'm now gonna turn it over to one of the very first undergraduates to work on that project, Terry Gross, who is a IP attorney and civil rights attorney in San Francisco. You're up, Terry. I mean, so basically, what happened at this one at the point is Andy brings Ted down to Brown, and where. You know, we're all working our late night hours in the computer lab and stuff. And they start in telling us that, you know, it's basically they start visioneering to us and, and telling us there's this now that we have digital computers and we have display screens, we're, we're, we're able to look at information in a different way. And information can all be. In all information in the universe can all be interconnected, and you, we can peer at it and we can manipulate it using display screens. But then they said, but then there's a kicker. This already exists, but you've been too blind to see it. It's like, you know, the blind man and the elephant's trunk. That that's what 
you know, what text has always been like. We're, you're limited by the tools that you have. And the tools that, that we've had so far have been either like stone tablets, st you know, stone tablets or, you know, paper and pencil, typewriters. That's sequential. That's the only way that you can look at text. But there have been these, these workarounds that have allowed, uh, you know, us mere mortals to peer into this intertwined, interconnected multiverse of documents, what Ted called the docuverse. And the way that you could, you, that you, you, these limited tools that, that us blind people had were footnotes and bibliographies and table of contents, which were different ways that took you out of this two-dimensional thread. And, and then they said, and there's also the bibliography and that's links. That's how all of the information in the universe is linked together. And this has already existed, but now we finally have, you know, w w with these digital tools and with the display screen as the device that allows us in, now you can finally see it. And it was, uh, you know, the, the, it, this was, you know, I guess I would say it was it's sort of, I think to us, it was like explaining to an early physicist string theory, or it, it, it was, given that it was the 60s, it was really a psychedelic view, that the, the insight that they gave us of what information was like that we had. But then Andy said, to, you know, Andy was saying, and Ted were saying to us, okay, but now the next task is, how are we going to access this and create this, you know, this, this in, uh, initial th thing? How, how are we going to be able to manipulate and use this information? And that's when they started talking about an author's console. I mean, we finally have some tools here to be able to do this. And so uh, um, the, the initial concept is let's have an author's console where we can sit there as as you've seen, at this display screen. And, and we want to be able to do two things. We want to be able to manipulate text. I mean, word processing, at that point, you know, Norm showed you the typewriter. Word processing was basically printing something out on a piece of paper, marking it up with red ink with all these arrows and cross outs, giving it to a secretary and have them manipulate it. And it was revolutionary to, to think that, wait a minute, you could do all of this by sitting at this terminal and poking at things. The only input device we had then was a, a light pen. We didn't even have mice yet. You know, it's just, but to, to be able to push at this thing, push some buttons and manipulate text. So that, I mean, that was the first thing. Let's manipulate text. But an essential part of what, they're, of what we were trying to develop also had the links and, the, you know, the, the hyperlinks and branching. And so it was basically... The, the assignment that, that, that we were given at this point was basically to, to using a computer, using a computer that has less computing power than the chip in your refrigerator, okay? How are we gonna be able to manipulate all of this text, create all of these links, store all of this information, be able to swap it in and out so that we can see it? And so that was, that was essentially our first assign, you know, the first assignments. But I'll leave you, I mean, there are two, two things about it. I mean, the first thing is that the initial visioning thing that when Ted started talking about the docuverse and everything, his descriptions of it, which I don't have time to read, though I was going to, you know, are, mimic exactly what we now know as, you know, the, the hypertext universe that we live in, almost every element of it. What you see up here and what you're going to hear after this is all the, the technical details that it took to get there. This is from a 1966 memo, you know, proposal of the Xanadu system that Ted did. And all of the elements that you see in here, an undo, you know, multiple screens, yeah, you know, all the linking, indexing, and stuff like that, all of the elements that we have now were envisioned back then before any of this existed. But the, the, I guess the second cautionary thing that I, that I will leave you with before this is just to understand that, that Ted, with all, everything that he has visioned, he is deeply upset with the fact that where this has led to is the World Wide Web, is that what we have right now is 
We're, we're still blind men in Ted's universe, and there are still many multi-dimensions that are, that are still for us to be defined and to find out later. And now I'll turn it over to the people who actually started developing it. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. <laughs> so here's some things about Hess. I won't take time to explain them to you because you know all this stuff already anyhow. It's just kind of a summary of the major features. Unidirectional links only at first. Ted's back button, hugely important. I think it's the most important function in any system, be able to undo in some sense. Uh, we had from graphics, master instances, where you could use blocks of text repeatedly. And I decided I wanted this really fancy paging system where pages would grow and shrink dynamically so that we could modify in place, basically. It turned out to be a very bad idea, but it worked. And Fress reset that idea. OK, uh, there's our friend Steve Carmody, <laughs> who went to Holland with Marty and a bunch of other people where we started a computer science department and a computer graphics research group. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about the details of S. That, by the way, is the traditional Dutch herring. And uh, that's how you eat it. <laughs> My daughter just recently took a trip to Copenhagen, and I was using this to inspire her. But she, she didn't take the bait. Hmm. OK, so this was our personal computer. Um, there's the person using it. <laughs> and I believe this is Chris Braun, we're told. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, uh, the only thing I regret is we had a, apparently you could get a 2250 that had a foot pedal. So when you pointed the light pen at the screen, you stomped the pedal. And, uh, but ours lacked the pedal. Um, so there's, um, this is, uh, so the initial one had a, the 2250 mod one on the top there. And later on, we had this wonderful 1130 computer and we were doing remote computing. We had an 80 foot long bisync line that connected the 1130 and uh, several people uh, wrote an emulator on the 1130 for the 2250. And that was, this was actually demoed by IBM at some point. In, at a computer at a, in Boston. Um, we were at the center of the IBM booth. I'm sorry, the, the, our code was at the center of the IBM booth. Um, they kept throwing me out of the booth. They thought I was spoiling <laughs> the show somehow. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the connections for some of the low-end devices that Fress initially supported. So 2741s are type liter literally selectrics. 2260 was a small display no, with a keyboard, no light pen or anything. Um, so can I give you this? because. So I'm going to demonstrate I'm old. I have notes. But in this, in this kind of a group, that's nothing to be ashamed of. He is so old that he has just retired from Brown. <laughs> years of service as a networking guru. Um, so Norm, to my immense regret, actually found the source for Hess <laughs> online. And, and then, unfortunately, David Duran took the bait, and he broke the files apart, so you can actually look at them. Um, so several things about that. It, um, it's amazing how, many, how few files there are. Uh, it's a small system compared to the systems we write today, that, pe that the undergraduates write today. It's, uh, it's almost trivial looking at it. And it's shocking how close it is to the hardware that uh, all, scattered through the code are all these things where it's embedding these hardware commands in the stream of data. Um, and it was written, you know, today people write programs, applications, and they're built on these huge frameworks. And that idea hadn't come into existence yet. So you've got this, giant, this mess of code. Um, oddly, it did, um, have, there was enough sense uh, to break it apart. and it. it it actually do, you know, was, to my mind, one of the first instances of this MVC model. So sitting over there is Mark Pizewski, who 
wrote the uh, display portion of the early on, and uh, uh, it did actually break apart on that using that model. Uh, but at this point, I think the code is useful primarily as a milestone, showing us how far the concepts of programming have evolved. Next, please. Um, the other thing that I think is really worth noting is the process that was used here. So, um, lost in the in the threads of in the web uh, in history is neither Mark nor I can remember how exactly we got involved here. Uh, it was we were taking we were taking applied math 101, 102. Uh, somewhere in the spring, the two of us got drafted into working on this vision. How that happened, we don't remember. I assume we got kidnapped in the middle of the night <laughs> and we were introduced to third shift. Um, I worked on Hess across the summer of 68 um, and Terry was there. I remember him ducking in and out. I remember him uh, needing to take a couple of weeks of a vacation in Chicago in the summer of 68. Um, and by Labor Day, there was a proof of concept for this system. And then from that point on, I remember the sort of collaborative process. People would use the system. There was constant feedback. There was constant evolution of the facility, the functionality the program offered. Things were added. Uh, sometimes things were taken back out. Uh, and this is the process that the commercial world has discovered, and they call it agile. But uh, we were doing this in 68 and 69. Um, the, the last thing I'd like to note is that when I got involved in this, I was, I think when I was probably 17 years old um, when I started working on this. I was not much more than a child, actually. Uh, that first summer of 68, I was living at home. My parents were having a little difficulty with the third shift routine. Um, and what didn't occur, it wasn't until years later that I looked back on this and realized that what I was doing that summer was building something that had never been imagined. Uh, but while I was in the middle of it, this was perfectly normal. Right? This, was, this was what you did. This was what you're supposed to do with your life. You're supposed to um, think. You know, when someone presents you with a problem, you're supposed to not worry about what they put in front of you. You're supposed to think about the, the real problem, the big problem. And then you're supposed to solve the big problem. Um, I didn't have time to think, you know, so Ted and Andy say, you know, they, they have this vision and they say, you know, go program it and, you know, you trust them, right? You know, if they say you go program it, it must be because it's possible, it's doable, <laughs> right? <laughs> and off you go. <laughs> um, but even more than that was their trust in us. And that you, I, I think you're going to hear this many times today, that they allowed us to do this. In a, they, they brought us in. They let us work on this stuff. And then they actually exposed us to IBM. And I remember a trip to the AP in New York, which was kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> um, there was the devil agency stuff. Um, the, they, had, um, they trusted us to be able to take these ideas and present them and grow them and build on them. Um, and that was my major take. It wasn't until years later I realized that was my major takeaway from all of this. That, and, I spent the last 20 years kind of building this infrastructure across the globe that supports distributed research. And, and the software team I led is, the, the software they built is used at 4,000 campuses and sites around the world. But, but it's you. I, you know, I was present, I, at one point we had a picture of a napkin on our website that started it. And that was the problem that was put in front of us. And we ended up with something very, that was much larger. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Steve. Great. Well, as part of Norm's enormous resurrection effort, uh, he managed to find a piece of really hard to look at videotape and then used his incredible multimedia skills honed at places like Macromedia, where he was the CTO, to put bits and pieces together. It's not easy to watch, but uh, we're going to get a live narration from Diane, who 
was the woman in the video that you'll be seeing. And that will give you a little bit of an intro to the feature set. OK, so um, all this. I, I, I should have mentioned Diane next became a fellow at IBM in networking. And then she had a second career as undergraduate Tsarina at UNC, from which she just retired. But she reassured me she's going to continue teaching. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> you think we're running a little late? The good news is it'll be as long as this video, maybe. Here we go. OK, so that's, that's the screen. Over on the left there, you could see the board. And you can tell we had high tech uh, graphics there. Um, basically going to create a link by just clicking on the, the uh, button there. In a second, you'll get a, a, an, asterisk, an asterisk that shows up. Um, we skipped a few pieces in, in this video, so you don't see us actually creating a label. Here's a description of where it's going. And you'll see it says, type in explainer or travel. Travel meant navigate to another part of the, of the system, we think. We're having a hard time remembering that part. Um, but in fact, this was a pointer to the biblio, bibliography. And magically comes up a, uh, an asterisk. There we go. And that's the link. Okay. And then we can follow the link. Here we go. OK, and if you, if you wanted to do it, you can click on the button that says Get Label. And here you go. It'll give us a list of all of the labels, which we magically created somewhere. This, there are pieces of it that some of us have been having a hard time remembering about, like. You could just see that one there. And the view specs is actually the, the text edit, the text formatting part of it. This is where we all, we're, we're, we're you know, the predecessor to Word and all of those good things. You can show the, the links or not, and we can create um, titles. I'm trying to remember where we are here. You can get justification. Yay. You can do that in hypertext, in, in HTML, too, these days. Uh, <laughs> different widths, um, different formats, how wide the, the columns are going to be. And I'm not speeding this. This is its own speed. Okay. And indent. Okay, We're going to do hanging indents. That's actually kind of risque for, for, the, for the internet still these days. <laughs> Negative in indent, you know, it was kind of exciting. There we go, and we've got <laughs> we've got the hypertext in hanging indent, and coming up, coming up. Do I need to click again? I think I need to click. Okay, this is just some 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 stills in case you couldn't read them when you were watching them. And we'll talk about how it was actually used. Thanks. <laughs> So I need to apologize to Greg Lloyd, who did a 16 millimeter movie. i completely forgotten about that. And this is from that lost, my apologies, movie that he made. You'll hear from him in just a moment. So where was this all used? Ted did an incredible design on a patent database, electroplating patents. Everything is intertwined, And that was our demo vehicle. We showed it at Time Life, AP, New York Times. And we said, this is the future. And they said, wow, really? And we predicted that people like journalists would be sitting and creating and editing their stories online. And they said, sure, sure, kid. In about <laughs> 20 years, maybe. It happened way sooner than that. And Joe Strandberg was one of the people who made that happen. Uh, another thing we did is we contributed to the shareware library. And Norm, an incredible Norm, found the actual bloody source on the web. And you can't quite read it, but that is the code, the assembly language code for branching. That's the header comment. And there's the nicely documented, nicely formatted assembly language code. Here is stuff he found reporting bugs. Notice the PSWs. Uh, 
Yeah, that's my handwriting on top and Ted's there. Uh, I skip, well, I'm going, I haven't quite mastered the user interface. One of the really cool things is, because it was distributed on the Type 4 library tape, Fred Brooks at UNC did a color terminal version of it, and their department apparently used this for multiple years. Years later, I got a thank you from an asset administrator saying they'd used the system uh, after IBM sold it to them, this was freely contributed, uh, to produce Apollo documentation, and apparently microfilm that we had typeset the documents for went to the moon, which is pretty neat. Okay, so we proved that yes, you could have online hypertext, yes, you could have online document creation. I forgot to mention that in my first year at Brown, I commuted once a month to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania by plane with carrying schlepping two decks of these things with my program on it so I could get half an hour on the computer at 2 o'clock in the morning. I had a personal computer, my mainframe. Compare and contrast to this idea, walking in and being online and expressing yourself in uh, arbitrary ways. That was amazing. IBM had never seen anything like this. They instantly took it and helped us trying to sell this, but we were a little ahead of ourselves. We did get a lot of press and one memorable TV show, and Greg Lloyd, who's also a master archivist and has been part of all five decades, I'm going to tell you about it. Okay, thank you. So um, I, um, let's see, there we go. I started my CS uh, career at Brown as a hypertext schlep in September of 1968, uh, two weeks into the AM 101-103 semester, and was immediately put to work. In October of the following year, uh, Andy, Bev Hodgson, uh, Al Basil, uh, Chris Brown, and I uh, were starring in a WGBH live TV show, 30 Minutes, uh, broadcast at 7.30 in the evening, whose premise was, after dinner, a professor and students talk in a 50s Ozzie and Harriet style living room, uh, actually adjoining Julia Child's WGBH kitchen and the PBS NewsHour set. So I won't read the slide, it was load of fun, loads of fun, but uh, the heart of the discussion was why we all cared about hypertext and why we thought it was going to be important. Uh, we saw great prospects for news and newspapers and journalism, great prospects for the arts, literature, music, great prospects for a platform for building new classes of applications, and my particular hobby horse, blazing trails across a wealth of knowledge. This is all based on the example of Brown's simple, relatively, hypertext editing system, which we all believed can and would change the world. That's what uh, Ted certainly wanted. That's what intrigued Andy. That's why he did it. And that vision and belief is why I believe that Hess actually made a difference. So from that screenshot of the, of the after dinner uh, TV show to this photo, which I used to print that photo for the uh, after dinner TV show, to this original print that was Andy was pointing to in that show, in that video. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Greg. Okay, did I eat the pointer or does somebody have it? Great. Yes, we are. Just in case you didn't realize it, Karen is our gong. She's been very kind so far, but I want to stay with her. So we had, I think, some early influence, but we realized this 2250 thing, which costs something like $150,000 in 1967 money, it'd be a million bucks just for the display today. That's never going to work. We need a multi-terminal version. And there was a lot of functionality we never got to implement. So let's build the next system. And that became FRES. FRES is an acronym I coined from the Yiddish to eat ravenously. 
because it was a memory hog. It used an entire 128K, which was a quarter of the memory of the mainframe. We ran a complete time sharing system in that 128K. So not too shabby, but still, it was a memory hog. And as you can see, we wanted to support a bunch of stuff. So uh, I'm going to set the stage, but David Durand, whom you will see in just a moment, is going to show you an actual demo of 50 to 40-year-old code. He got it to run. He'll tell you how he managed that feat of most impressive magic. So what do we want to do? Well, a little bit of history. We developed HESS essentially completely independently of NLS. I didn't know about Engelbart and NLS. Hadn't properly done my homework because he had published documents which were available. Nothing was online in those days. I just was ignorant. In any case, because I was ran, running a session at the Fall Joint Computer Conference in December of 68, I happened in on this demo, and it was the most amazing demo I have ever seen, and I predict it's the most amazing demo that anybody will ever have seen. They spent today's money something like a million dollars. It was a complete rock musical whatever you want to call it. It had an army of people. They threw a boatload of money at it. It was professionally produced. It was truly mind-blowing in the literal sense. And I staggered when I saw what they were doing, which was way ahead of what we were doing. So I came back and I said, guys, we are working on this new system. I don't think I'd coined the name even by that time. Whatever we were thinking, it's off the table. We need to steal the best ideas. So Fress is an amalgam of what I learned about NLS. Doug very kindly invited me to spend a couple of days in his lab really learning about the system. I came back with lots of ideas, and that is Fress. What we learned from Hess, what I learned from Doug, and NLS, and here are some things we still believe the uh, Nelson notion of text arbitrarily long strings, don't break it up in statements, and we added device independence on a variety of terminals which Doug didn't have for NLS. And so see it as the next generation system. Like NLS, it had a prefix command language, so you said MV for move, and then specified the scope of the string that you wanted to move as the source, where you wanted to move it to as the destination. You could do it with a light pen, or you could type text strings, LP, light pen, or location pointer. We had various kinds of hypertext. Dave will uh, show them to you. We did introduce NLS's hierarchy for people who wanted it. We had sophisticated viewing controls, which David will talk about. So I think the best thing to do is instead of talking about this stuff, actually demoing it. And so with great pleasure, I turn it over to David Durant. I don't need that. OK. 50-year-old um, code. Uh, they got nothing up my sleeve. Um, hang on. Uh, so unlike Norm, I could not go on eBay and buy a 360, um, <laughs> or even a 370, which was you know a little later. Um, so uh, so uh, for, I, I'm gonna gonna start by saying that we did have done press demos before and way post press. So in 1989, we did one at the Hypertext Conference. And in 1996, we did it again because we knew Brown's mainframe was about to go away. And we had been able to run press continuously on the IBM hardware because IBM really likes backward compatibility. Um, so, But we figured at that point it was gone. Um, uh, I did these demos with Steve DeRose, who's here. Steve wrote a beautiful press file exporter that turns it into SGML. Uh, so, so we actually have, uh, and I've kept that up to date. Um, 
Uh, Sid Bauman helped out by actually spinning the backup tapes that had been made by the computer science department when the mainframe was going away. So I had these bits in my disk. And then at some point, I found out about a marvelous program uh, called Hercules, which lets you run a 370 in your computer. Uh, you'd notice uh, from the little bars up there, it's not really taking that much of my laptop, uh, although it's not doing anything. That's the operator's console, so you know I could finally have control over the computer. Um, uh, step back a second, my background, since I did not work on press, why I'm here doing this, I was, uh, oh, my microphone is down. I was a, a faculty brat and the first one to have a computer account. So I started using the computer at Brown in 1972. So Fress actually became a part of my high school career because I used it to do my papers. Um, uh, so the way Fress worked was it's a satellite computer. We're looking at, we're about to be looking at the virtual IMLAC, and when I'm using the mouse and so forth, this is replacing those light pen hits when you would pick stuff on the screen. And when I drag, um, that actually sends two light pen hits. And the way Fress worked is you type the command, and then it built the command up in the buffer so you could change your mind and un not submit the command, and then you hit carriage return. So I'm now going to start typing and doing some Fress things for you. Uh, I'm going to start off with the leech file. Um, this was uh, a textbook, um, a linguistic guide to English poetry. It was one of the many resources available to the students in the poetry course, which will be talked about in the next session. Um, uh, Joe Strandberg typed in this entire book from, I believe, a penguin. You, you'll tell us. Um, and uh, of course, you could scroll around. Uh, there's a little italics here on the page, so we had fonts. Fress supported Greek and special symbols for uh, bibliographies. David, yeah. just mentioned Tyler's emulator. They're uh, not looking yes, at Fress. Yes, yes. I, so I, one person that I didn't mention is that this emulator, I wrote the first two emulators for the first two demos. I was not going to write another one for the Engelbart Symposium. Andy offered uh, Tyler Schick's uh, help as a student. And he wrote this really nice emulator. And working together, you know, I helped him with specs and fixing bugs and so forth. And we even managed to get the light pen hits to work, which I had never done before. Um, there will be some demo opportunities later if you want to see more. Um, Computers were slow, as Norm and Andy have reminded us, so you couldn't scroll through a 350-page document. You couldn't even search the whole document unless you used the slow search that would take a minute. So I'm going to do get label, the feature that was also in Hess, and I know that there's an index in this book, and when I get label to the index, bam, this is the entire index of the print book converted to hypertext links, again by Joe, who was one of the master uh, Fress users. Um, one of the great things about Fress was how dynamic all the displays were, and we're going to see a couple of examples of that. But here, just quickly, I'm going to switch to edit view specs, so you can see all the codes he had to type to get the indentation and, and everything to look nice. Um, uh, I'm going to run a command macro. Fress had let you make your own commands out of little fresh commands, you can make your own. This IMLAC command just resets the view specs to a good browsing situation. Um, you're only seeing one window, so what's with that? Well, you had to use the set window command to pick what shapes of windows you wanted. There were seven different shapes, up to four windows at a time. So now I'm just going to um, do the light pen click here for a jump. Um, and follow to the chapter on the irrational in poetry. Um, you may have noticed these numbers, 15. There were chapter numbers. These were decimal labeled blocks that automatically tracked, and it could be 2.3.5.2. .2. Um, in uh, this section on the irrational, we see percent %t, 6.1. Percent told you you had hypertext. That's a decimal label tag to section 6.1. And if I rearrange the sections, the tags all update. So you always had up-to-date references. Um, I'm now going to switch to a slightly different setup. And I'm going to show a little bit uh, about 
the editing. Uh, and I think I can stick, I'm gonna go to two window layout here and I'm gonna get, uh, get the file test. I'm gonna get it into window two. You could select which window would be affected. Uh, get file, uh, oh, sorry, demo. Put it into window two. Yeah, just, just a quick double check. <laughs> ah! All right. We're going to take a moment while the virtual machine reboots behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> it is a real demo. Yes, this is, this is now proof. Um, we have to shorten, David. I know it's it, we're getting we're getting a little late. Um, we probably want to skip editing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, it's too bad. So the thing that I was going to show, which I will. Um, uh, oh, I hope it didn't crash again while I was in the background. No. Oh, I think it's just my bad typing. Um, uh, the thing that I was going to show was there was a structure space, so a special view that showed you all the links and all the blocks. If you edited in structure space, it also edited the text space, so I was going to rearrange sections. You can see it afterwards on the, on the official demo. I want to uh, show a little bit of the experience of the poetry class, so I'm going to start with Elliot. Um, uh, and the way this worked was there were several different kinds of assignments. Now, wait a minute, that doesn't look like T.S. Eliot. Uh, Fress had, and I think this is one of the most important features of Fress, a thing called display keywords. So you could make a Boolean request of keywords that turned the visibility of things on and off. And this is what Joe Strandberg was the master of configuring, and so I'm going to use the view all macro, and I'm going to get the instructor TA view of this poetry file. So the first thing, each poem had three different passes through it. I'm going to uh, use the label. I know that the responses to the first item on Elliot are in RESP1, and here the instructor can see all of the uh, different uh, student comments. Uh, Kate, Kate does not want to click on her comment, but uh, I'm going to uh, hit the wrong one. Uh, it shows up in the next window. It's the response of KMA to Elliot. You go down, she you know, says what she does, and then we get uh, a comment uh, uh, from the instructor saying, I agree that the opening second person pronoun calls for. This was the experience in the class. They came in. Um, they interacted, they interacted with each other and the professor. I believe they wrote a lot. And the final one that I just want to show, and we don't have to do anything more with it, um, uh, is this is the directory file of all the resources that were available, every poem indexed. This was one file. It was linking to 10 other files on the disk. Uh, so even though the file didn't have a file size limit, people tended practically to want to organize it. So, this gives you a sense of how much was available. Just take one minute and talk about your dad's use of it. Oh, yep. Uh, sorry. Uh, so hypertext was a family affair in the Durand <laughs> household, and computing was generally. Um, uh, so um, I'm just going to switch to a single window view and... Uh, uh, so my father uh, was associate uh, provost for faculty for a while, working in University Hall. Um, this, again, is um, uh, a file that has a lot of use specs. Uh, it was also done by Joe Strandberg. Um, so I just set a keyword display string. I said anything that's tagged with the tag all. And we see all of the faculty here. Uh, OK, so that's nice. Um, if I switch to the edit view for a second, you can see that there's a lot of coding here. And all of these things, you know, visiting assistant professor, the secretaries used to have to type that every single time they did the roster. There was a code here. They could just say it's a VRA. It's a visiting research associate. And it all came out. If we look at the structure space view, we see that everything is keyworded with blocks, gender, 
age, retirement status, department. Uh, so, you ha so they use this as kind of a database uh, before there was a database. Uh, and with that, I'll just say that the best thing about doing this demo has been how much fun it is to play with Fress. And so <laughs> come take a look, and I'll show you some stuff. Those of you who went through applied math in the early days will recognize many of those names. Pardon? You tried to erase it before. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, we need to take you off the screen. Yeah. So you heard a little bit of a sneak preview of the poetry experiment. And I'm going to tell you about that. And then we're going to have the people who really did it speak to it. Before that, let's just say it was used in a number of sites, unlike Hess. Uh, Carol is going to talk about its use in a course in the physics department. And there were actually commercial spin-offs. Uh, Craig Mathias worked on the one for Raytheon called Raytext for a while. National CSS, which was a time-sharing service startup that came out of the Cambridge Scientific Center that built CPCMS. Uh, created an office in Providence, and we were going to be their online documentation and hypermedia provider. And we had a 4,800 baud private line to the huge mainframe running CPCMS in Norwalk, Connecticut. It was divine until they uh, started going south financially, and they laid off 30 of us. But it was great while it lasted. Uh, Hess itself was shown to a large number of people. And I just want you to look at these names. Licklider, Knuth, and Brooks in the space of a couple of weeks. Pretty amazing. And we have, we don't know who kept these notes. I didn't know we had it until Norm found this stuff. And we had a lot of visitors. Uh, here's a little bit of fresh, I can't read it. Maybe you make jump. Again, nicely annotated code. And now I want to talk about one particular use, which is this landmark course taught uh, in the English department using our system. Um, because of the earlier course and the good thoughts that a lot of us put together in a proposal that Craig Mathias brought to us today, so you can all look at the proposal that NEH accepted, uh, they decided to fund us. And this is the control card for the Royal McBee card retrieval system with needles, with <laughs> old technology with which you could find things. Now, this card is really important because I had a call two years ago from a program manager at NEH who said, as you may know, and you may have read about it in Time Magazine, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary for NEH. They featured some of the projects we funded. Yours was one of them. And I want to read back to you, in case you don't remember it, a documentary film about the project is being produced. Did you guys ever produce this film? And I said, amazingly enough, A, we did, and B, I actually have it as a print. So cut to the chase. We organized the symposium at the University of Maryland. It was the first public showing of the film. The entire top hierarchy of NEH came out for it. Directors, subdirectors, program managers. They bought, brought the tray with a bunch of cards and the needle to search it and drop this card. It was a fabulous celebration. And you got a little piece of it from the folks who, who actually did the work. So, here are the, some of the people who worked on it. That's Marty's wife. The KMA that uh, David talked about, whose trails we followed, we had David follow that particular trail because it was really good without knowing who KMA was. It turns out it's Marty's wife. Ma sorry? Norm's wife. No, Norm's wife. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. <laughs> small editorial correction there. And she famously said to him, ah, that hypertext stuff. I knew about that years before you even heard the term. <laughs> and so she did. Very nice. OK, so uh, 
uh, take it away, guys. Who's up next for the poetry experiment? Carol? Carol? The video is going right now. You just saw a little bit. Yeah. Oh, OK. There you go. Uh, you going to go? Who's first? I've forgotten. Oh, Carol's going to say first. For OK. Okay, Carol is a distinguished yeah. professor of law at University of Minnesota. Okay, so we've been, you, you had an intro to the poetry course and we're gonna spend most of this time talking about the poetry course, but I wanna back up one stage. There was also a reference in, the, um, in one of Andy's slides to the course done and he mentioned there was a course done before the poetry course. Um, funded by Exxon Education Foundation, um, jo Professor George Seidel, physics professor, uh, taught an interdisciplinary course called Man, Energy, and the Environment, which my memory says was a modes of thought freshman seminar. Could be right, could be wrong, I don't remember. Craig says yes, so I think it was. Um, and, um, and we had, it was for a year, it was 73, 74, 12 students, a few of them with computer background, mostly not. It was the first effort to put hypertext into teaching in this format with people who were not computer connected. Um, and the experiment ran for the year. Um, uh, just brief conclusions were, it, it worked. <laughs> I mean, people used it, the students used it. Um, early data mining before uh, institutional review boards, the, the, fun, the report, which I just saw this morning, has the names of the students who were involved and it tells how many times they clicked and what they clicked on. It's, it's like, you it wouldn't have a report in quite that format now. Um, but they, they enjoyed using it. Um, they, they tolerated a change in color of the, of the text in the middle of the semester and dealt with that. I mean, it was, but these were students who had never dealt with computers before at all, many of them. Um, but it was, a, it was an information delivery system, really, more than anything else. It was not an interactive environment. It, it was, but students didn't do very much with that, so it was successful. Um, students followed links, but it was a passive um, clicking on something, going, reading something else, using multiple windows. But, um, but it, it didn't test, really, the, the strength um, and the complexities that were envisioned by Andy and others um, in using hypertext, which led to the proposal to do the poetry course. So, um, we'll get into uh, talking about the poetry course a little bit um, after we show you uh, a couple of, um, we're gonna use the word text a lot, a couple of texts that related to the poetry project. I should probably get that playing. Oops, there we go. Um, Basically, the, the first delivery system, if you will, for, for information on this project was, yes, print medium. Uh, on the left is the uh, NEH report, um, which came out in 76. Uh, on the right is uh, an article that I was tasked with, with writing and through the vagaries of print production. That came out in 79. Um, what we've been talking about a lot is, is uh, how we really didn't know what we were precursors to. But if you look down at the... Um, uh, second column, um, second, uh, first full column, second column, uh, pardon me, first full paragraph, second column, you will note that we blithely said that um, a hypertext is thus best seen as a web of interconnected materials. And so there we are. <laughs> There's that word web. Uh, where it came from, uh, none of us can actually remember. Uh, we're happy that we even remember the course. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, we had another... Um, delivery system, if you will. And this is the film that, that Andy was talking about. Uh, it's about three minutes long. Um, the whole film was, was somewhere around 17 minutes long, but, but this is about a three minute clip that we've trimmed out of it. Um, and you will see all of us in, in our um, youthful glory. Uh, it's, it's a little distressing for us to watch, but we hope you enjoy it. So let's see if we can get this going. Using this system, uh, we hope that we can take some of the fear of poetry out of the student, and also that we can solve some of our own problems of communication and innovation in the classroom, that we'll be able to put students in contact with one another through the system about the poetic materials, and that instructors and students will also achieve a higher level of communication and a greater understanding of the materials involved. In preparing for the computer-based course, the first step is to gather the raw materials the primary and secondary texts. The instructor selects manuscripts and portions of manuscripts that relate best to the central themes of the course. 
and the material is organized, giving an initial structure. <laughs> the poetry course material is broken into 12 units, each of which concentrates on a particular poem. The students will have three sessions with each unit. At the first session, they will view only the poem which is central to the unit. At the second session, they will view material to place the poem in context. This material includes biographical and genre information, other poems by the same poet, and poems by other poets, which influence or have been influenced by the central poem. At the third session, secondary source material will be added. After reading some or all of the material in each session, the student will add his or her comments to the information available at the next session. The instructors and students will all have an opportunity to add comments and questions to evaluate and critique each other's work. Each new arrangement of a text provides the opportunity for something greater than simple transmission. If various texts can be interestingly arranged, juxtaposed, fitted with each other, and played off against each other, the process of reading a text can be made concrete, and the text itself may no longer be isolated, pristine, and inviolate but manifold and pluralistic. This web of interrelated text is called a hypertext. The computer system we use to create and manipulate hypertext is called FRES. FRES, which is the computer system being used in the poetry course, takes no particular training in order to operate it beyond an ability to type. And we use the keyboard to specify commands to the system which set up questions, uh, insert comments, and browse through the system in a manner to set up dialogues, a dialogue not only with poetry, but also with professors, with other students in the course. This dialogue feature can be used as little or as much as possible at the student's own behest, and he can use initials of himself or of other students to browse selectively through a particular set of comments or a particular set of questions. And furthermore, what is really exciting is he can blaze a new trail by looking at themes or images in a set of poems and entering his thoughts into the hypertext for others. This kind of selective browsing and adding to the creative graffiti, you might call it, we hope to use to develop a different kind of community with professors and students working together to develop a true process of learning. Okay. So, um, yes, uh, that would be me, um, and that's Josiah, and the other person would be Carol, for those of you who didn't know who Carol was. Um, uh, I mean, it's pretty, pretty obvious, I think, from everything that's gone before, um, and also, um, um, I guess, from, from our youthfulness, that um, you mentioned that the, the Exxon project was more of a delivery system. And we never did see this project as a delivery system. Uh, Fresh was not, in our mind, a delivery system, and English 16 was not a poetry course. Uh, we're, we're thinking much larger, perhaps um, uh, overblown thoughts, um, but effectively we felt that what we were doing was we were, we were developing a philosophy of a concept that, for lack of a better term, we would call textuality. And textuality itself, uh, in, in the building of, of, of the project, and Joe was deeply involved in it, uh, what we're doing, we're modeling uh, in our own minds uh, a form of understanding. That's, that's how far uh, a field we had sort of gone with our thinking about this. Uh, and in terms of, uh, of, of the project, we we're also modeling uh, a form of pedagogy. And then when we actually put the course together and, and did it, uh, we we're performing, um, for lack of better terms, uh, we we're performing an epistemology and we we're performing a pedagogy. Uh, it was a process that we, we felt we were actually engaged in. It might have been overblown, uh, I don't know, but that, that's how we felt at the time. Um, I'll give you a quick example of it, and then uh, uh, Carol and, and Josiah have, uh, have some time that they want to speak to you. Um, example of it was that, that we're talking, we've been talking about hypertext uh, and how this is all a web of interconnected texts. But interestingly enough, when we designed the course, the first thing a student would see in the first session is only the bare poem. Um, why we made that decision is, is lost in the ether. Um, 
but the next time it would actually, uh, they would come in and, and the poem would, would basically light up like, like a Christmas tree. You would have the structure, the poem, the tree, and then all of a sudden, bing, turn the lights on and you'd have all the links that students had built um, while they're reading in their first session. Um, if, if the tree metaphor doesn't work for you, then, then it was like a night sky. Um, you're in the city and you, um, you can see the moon because it's bright enough. Get out in the country, all of a sudden, all the stars are appearing as, as well. Uh, those are two metaphors, uh, which I think are appropriate for a course in poetry. Um, but I'm going to stop now and I'll hand it over to um, people who are working with the, the machine side, if you will. So one, th one thing, um, so my involvement at the time, I was a graduate student in philosophy. My um, advisor was Roderick Chisholm, and uh, Chisholm had the uh, Andrew W. Mellon chair, which was the senior chair in humanities, and it gave him uh, the right to have a secretary part-time, and I ended up being the secretary part-time. I had, was nearing the end of my uh, uh, studies. So uh, through finagling by Andy and, and uh, Professor Chisholm, they got money for me, and Chisholm said to me, you can use as much money as you want, but you've got to teach me how to use this system. And, and I did, and he became, and we'll discuss that a little bit, but he became phenomenally productive and said later that he did two years of work in uh, six months. And he finished two books, which he wouldn't have done otherwise, and numerous articles and publications. I was involved in a lot of that stuff. Um, so, uh, so we, there, we did a final report about NEH uh, project, and there were some conclusions that we got. One of them was the phenomenal productivity of the students. Uh, I recognize this wasn't strictly hypertext because in a, we were competing with typewriters and pens and paper. And so just basic text editing gave, gave people a lot of power. A uh, typical course would have, uh, I guess there were 12 sessions, so you would expect 24 pages. The average number of pages in this course was 84, uh, ranging from 50-something to uh, one student did 137 pages of, of comments and text and thoughts and papers. So uh, the, other, the other thing that struck me was the technology. Uh, technology that was so great to us was really very primitive from today's standards. We had one terminal that the students accessed. And, uh, and so we had to allocate hours. Each pe person had two hour segments, uh, which you had to sign up for and plan. My role at that time, well, I've already, uh, David mentioned that I input a lot of the material. We were very proud of the fact that we had a thousand pages of material. Um, that the students had access to, and it was very uh, useful, but all that material, you know, the cutting and pasting we just saw, all that ended up with somebody typing that material into the system. I did have the joy of, of inputting the, uh, the Leach uh, book. So just access to material, that was sort of, of crude, uh, that we had one terminal, and uh, right now we take, it, 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 we take for granted all, of, all, all access. And the third thing, which maybe somebody else could talk about, was the community that we developed offline. Do you want to talk about that? So uh, we're running out of time, so we'll say some things here. Happy to talk about it, any of us, um, afterwards and through the rest of the day. Um, so just a little bit more about the technical thing. Among, so one computer, one room, two-hour slots, and it had to be across the street from the computer lab so that the text would come in fast enough. It was 1,200 baud. It was 120 characters a second. It was faster than reading speed. That was like terrific, you know. But, but by today's standards, I mean, the slowness of it was amazing. Um, it, so I learned the numbers of this looking at the final report. The 360 through the semester crashed 123 times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jim said earlier, and every time that happened, he called me, right? So I'm the technical person. And Fress had some issues. We had to build new things. So the fact that it worked as well as it did and that the students were as successful in their work, given that technical crudity, is, is quite amazing. Um, but, but on the other side of it, I think for the years since, in terms of takeaways, I have said for years, 
and I, th I think I will continue to say, although uh, the rest of the day and some of the stuff in the afternoon may, may show me things I don't know are going on, um, I'm, I'm not in computers anymore. I went to law school, I'm a law teacher, but I use computer systems in teaching, but it is so still crude in terms of the per conceptions of how to use these tools. Finally, I mean, we, we started, you know, it's, it's, very, it's still very sequential, it's still very delivery, because whether you're talking about traditional computer-assisted instruction, um, giving people information, testing them, letting them follow links like that, or, or what we're doing now in sort of classroom teaching, interactive teaching in the classroom, cooperative learning. We haven't yet figured out a way, I think, by and large, to use these kinds of tools. I think that this was still, the Poetry Project was still incredibly innovative and better than most uses of computers in teaching. Today in the classroom, we need more information spread out so that people can use new systems. We had a couple of slides that just showed, you know, we uh, uh, using Moodle, um, which is Jim's, and using Canvas, which finally we're progressing to um, at the University of Minnesota, which gives some tools, but we haven't figured out how to use them yet. And my only, re I have two regrets from, uh, in looking back at the project. One is that I didn't take the poetry course because I still don't get poetry. <laughs> and I think if I took the course, I would have learned more. And the other is that I didn't stay. I sort of left this behind and went on to law and now belatedly realized that I should have kept my mind on how to use these kinds of tools um, on the teaching side. Um, but I think we can still get there. You want to finish up, Jim? <laughs> Do you want to make any concluding remarks oh, I, um, as this is scrolling by? Yeah, it'll go around, and then, then you get to hear uh, Orson Welles. Um, maybe he won't play with her. Intuition also tell you about my wife. Wife, it was accosted in the street a little while ago and led across to some dive on your side of the border. Hmm. Here we go. Yeah, I, I, I hate to cut out him laughing, but yeah, that's, that was Moodle. Uh, as you can tell, uh, LSU is behind the times. We're still running an ancient version of Moodle. Um, this is Canvas, which was um, uh, Carol's system, is Carol's system. Um, we wanted to show you um, where we've come and in some ways how all we're doing is reinventing the wheel uh, in, in lo lots of instances. But um, that's a sense of, of what we're trying to do, and I, I think we're trying to evidence um, how, how um, innovative we actually, in looking back, feel that we were in, in this project. Let's see where we were. No. Sure. When, I, I know. Um, I, so we talked about, I, talk, I, I mentioned the idea of this being innovative in terms of delivery, but also that notion of community that Joe ended and sort of just I ended and handed off. There are so many tools now. I mean, there's, you know, track change documents and Google Docs and creating wikis together. And we have still not harnessed that for creating the online community. It happens in pieces. I think it happens for many of us with our colleagues, but trying to figure out how to have it happen with our students. One of the ideas mentioned in the final report, which when I read it, I thought, why didn't we think of this? Why, why don't I do this? Is students, in order to use the, this tool to really talk with each other, they need to create their own hypertext first and then share it with others, and then they'll start to use the system more effectively. And I think that's an idea that we can bring forward so that we can take what we learned from this project and, and really um, uh, colonize <laughs> the universities. Thanks. Thank you. The poetry course was the world's first example of an online scholarly community. There's no doubt about that, even though they weren't online simultaneously. Um, all right, Norm, back to you. Okay. Well, I'm going to go through this quickly. The late 70s, because we're switching now to the late, I have a. Am I on? To the late 70s. If you went to school, that's what you looked like. Um, your calculator was this, and if, if you were a regular person, it cost 355 bucks in today's. Um, dollars. If you were a cool computer scientist, you got one that did hex and you spent $15 more. Um, your word processor was a Smith Corona, and if you were cool like me, you had the Report Deluxe. Um, and then that was the state of the world, and the next uh, thing we're going to hear about is Steve Feiner. That's a picture of the graphics lab, and while people were using Smith Corona typewriters, 
Um, the graphics group was using a RAM tech, which was a very high-end uh, bitmap color graphics display. So with that, Steve can't be here because he had another engagement, but he is, um, I believe he's on Zoom. Steve? Hello? There you go, Steve. You're on. Okay, good. So my, you can actually hear me as well, right? Yes. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so I guess it's my turn to start. So what you're looking at over here is a uh, printed screenshot of a page from the interactive graphical document system, which is being shown in context of a beautiful plastic mock-up that Andy had commissioned uh, to show the maintenance and repair workstation of the future in a picture courtesy of Greg Lloyd. I'm just uh, showing it off, Steve. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Ah, good. Okay, so. 1982. <laughs> yes. So let's move on a little bit. So what's the paradigm behind IGD? Uh, the idea was to move from the text with some graphics of the systems that you've just heard about to more graphic-centric graphics with some text, uh, to also move from the scrolling systems uh, like uh, Hess and Fress. Uh, to ones in which uh, hypertext was linking together screen size laid out in advanced pages um, that contained pictures, buttons that could be pressed, and actions that were invoked by displaying a picture, pressing a button, or even entering a page in the directed graph. So those pages were embedded in the chapter hierarchy. They were linked together uh, in a directed graph. Um, and the pictures were defined as hierarchies of 2D primitives, courtesy of all of the neat vector graphics that preceded this work and the standardization efforts that were going on at the time. So the machine, or rather the system, was actually could be thought of as being a state machine. All the pictures, buttons, and links could be keyworded, and if their keywords uh, were matching those in a keyword pool that would be updated by those actions that I just mentioned, then they would actually be active or displayed. So the domain uh, behind most of the work that was getting done over here and the funding was maintenance and repair assistance with lots of O&R funding. So, what are the key features? The document structure, all the page contents, the chapter hierarchy, the directed graph of links, all of that was created with a graphical editor, so you could actually show and point, uh, draw on the screen a link from one place to another, and that would actually uh, create the link in the system. Um, all of this was maintained in the mighty ERIS relational database system, courtesy of Steve Rice. Um, among the things that IGD could do is sketchy layout. Um, you could sketch in a placeholder picture. You could draw a so-called fuzzy link saying, I'd like to have a link from this chapter to that page without really going into the details. All those things would be maintained in the database and could later be refined with real pictures and real links. Um, we also had automatic generations of certain kinds of pages that you could show when you were presenting. And I will show you some examples of those very shortly. Um, another thing that we were very proud of is the idea that we could selectively control um, the level of detail that was displayed for pages, for the chapter hierarchy, for the links, um, on the part of the person actually doing the editing of the document. And the idea was to address the kind of disorientation and clutter in large graphs that people would later talk about as being the lost in hypertext problem. So to give you a high level example of what you're gonna see when you actually look at the screenshots, here we have a bunch of pages or representations of them linked together with links already. There's not a lot of pages, not a lot of links, but it's looking kind of complicated. So we can embed these uh, within this chapter hierarchy. And then with the chapter hierarchy, we can play some tricks. We could look at a link, for example, follow its parentage up until on both ends of the link, we ended up with parents that had the same ancestor and then only draw the links between that set of parents. If we did that, a lot of those links disappear, and these links are now more like metal links, showing that something in this chapter leads to something in that chapter, for example. Of course, when we've got chapters, we can then do some suppression, so we don't see the things inside of a particular chapter or the pictures in a page, and of course, we can select one of those chapters or pages and make it take up the whole screen, or as we'll see in a window-based document layout system, uh, the entirety of a window. Um, 
This is uh, literally scanned from uh, our uh, transactions on graphics volume one, number one paper. It shows the architecture at the top level, three components, picture layout system for making pictures, document layout system for making documents, document presentation system for actually presenting those documents. All the pictures were maintained in a modeling system, so the pictures were hierarchical, um, and as I said before, uh, were composed of individual primitives. Um, and all this is running on top of a graphics package that was roughly designed to be like some of the standards that were being created at the time. And the document layout and presentation systems both relied on um, all the structure of the document maintained in a database system. So this is a cast of thousands, well maybe not quite thousands, but software developed by a bunch of folks, documents created by a bunch of folks, um, our Dutch uncle overseeing everything and making sure that stuff was going to work um, and funding coming in from ONR and NSF. Um, a page from uh, one of, or two pages from one of those documents uh, about the system that we wrote back in 1981-82 um, and a page from some source code uh, unfortunately, this wasn't from the core of the system, but rather from an animation language I'd written, which was used for some of those actions that I mentioned. Um, here was the mighty Ramtech, which still lives in the Brown Museum right now. And I'm not sure the status of the VAX. To be still fair, there. this was this was Nancy, not Sluggo, so I don't have the actual VAX, but I have its, uh, uh, its sister. Um, so now for a demo, first I'm going to show you a bunch of screenshots, then because of the uh, low quality video that we'll have over Zoom, uh, we're going to switch to actually having the video uh, that was recorded and displayed live. So these are all screenshots captured directly digitally, so these will even look better than they did back then. First image over here, which I hope you're seeing. Um, yeah. is a page from the document presentation system uh, from obviously a maintenance and repair manual, pictures at the top, buttons at the bottom, um, a little uh, where you are, a list at the bottom showing you the name of the page, chapters all the way up to the top level and the time, unfortunately not with the year actually showing. So we'll now go from the document presentation system to the document layout system. Um, and here you're seeing a set of non-overlapping windows. Each contains a black-bordered chapter, like the one at the lower right, or white-bordered pages. The one at the lower right actually is the entirety of this particular manual, um, with a lot of detail removed. So you can see at this level, this is basically a three-element graph of chapters, fully connected. Every one of the chapters connects to and from every one of the other ones. At this point, we're going to decide to show you some detail. And so you'll see that little cursor uh, in the lower left of that big window. And when we press the plus detail button a couple of times, you're now seeing lots of extra detail inside. And so now we're going to move down into one of the chapters. So that cursor's on top of it. We go down into it. It takes up that window. Um, and at this point, we'll actually make a button. So this kind of button is going to be a uh, upright uh, rectangle. So we're going to determine two points by clicking along one of its diagonals. And you're seeing a little help uh, documentation at the lower right-hand corner there. Choose the first point. So we choose two points. And then through the miracle of color lookup table animation with the eight bit deep, uh, bits deep worth of uh, display that we had, we dim the screen, put up a set of nice bright white uh, names of the different kinds of actions. We're going to choose a get new page action. We're going to go and select the page uh, from another list or from what's on the screen to be able to show the destination of that link. And then when we do that, we see a little arrow going from that page, that whiteboard page on the right, to, turns out, the chapter that's in, it's inside of the, the destination, that is. Um, and now at this point, we might want to know a little bit more where that really is. And instead of using this kind of detail suppressed version, we can say, gee, we really want to see what this is linked to, even if the arrows are going to go across chapter boundaries and across window boundaries. And when we do that, you see two links coming out of that page. And now we just made one link, but it turns out that those two pages in the two little windows at the left are actually the same page, but being seen in context of different uh, keywords. So. Uh, because of the difference in the keywords, that page now shows different pictures. So, let's see, at this point, 
we decide we would like to go up in that window at the lower right to see the entirety of that page um, that the link uh, is coming from. And now it occupies the entirety of that window. And now we might want to see, hmm, what about the parents of this thing? Let's actually make this page go out of window mode into the full screen mode. And when we do that, we are now, because we also did some other stuff, we decide we want to go up uh, within the hierarchy. The screen dims again. We're now seeing the complete set of parents of that page uh, on the right. The little arrow is next to the one that says reference manual. That's the very top level. When we select that, we go up to the very top level of the document with that added uh, amount of information. So very quickly, I will show you a couple of views of the automatically generated pages that I mentioned. We go from document layout to document presentation. Now you're seeing the links page, uh, whatever the current page was uh, when we're actually traversing the document, it's going to be at the center in its first uh, level of chapter. At the left, you'll see all of the pages that reference it. If there were more, you'd see a little arrow at the bottom that lets you scroll through the list. Uh, scroll is really uh, aspirational. It would very chunkily wipe the left part of the page and display the other pages. And on the right, you see all the pages you can go to. If I select that page at the bottom of the column of pages at the right, it becomes at the center. And now we can see the pages that you went to it from and the ones you could go to. And now we can look at our timeline page where you're seeing uh, wherever you went into this from, uh, the history of what you did during that session, timestamps uh, across the bottom, uh, each page inside of its nesting chapter going back to the beginning of the session. And then finally, I'll show you our index page in which you can type in a key phrase and you'll see all of the pages in the document um, sorted by their containing chapter all little miniatures drawn courtesy of that modeling system um, on the screen. So Steve, can at we go this to point, the demo? Now? We're about to go to the demo. Good. So um, you're going to go and put it up locally over there, and we're going to let Nicole take over. One quick thing to mention when you start is that any point in which you see the screen smoothly crossfade, any point in which you see it cut, all that is done in the video camera and video editing. And any place where it slowly gets drawn and you see rectangles slowly drawn, that's the speed at which the Ramtech went. Two seconds to draw a single rectangle the size of the full screen. So take it away, Nicole. We have designed a prototype document as an example of a system that might run on our maintenance or repair kit of the future. This is the first page of an electronic maintenance and repair manual for a sonar system. When I log on to the system, I am identified as an expert repair technician. Another user might be classified as a novice or an intermediate. A user's status dictates the... Oops. Hold on. My fault. PEPCAC error. We have designed a prototype document as an example of a system that might run on our maintenance and repair kit of the future. This is the first page of an electronic maintenance and repair manual for a sonar system. When I log on to the system, I am identified as an expert repair technician. Another user might be classified as a novice or an intermediate. A user's status dictates the path he or she travels in this dynamic non-sequential document. This next page shows the location of the ship and the sonar cabinets. We are actually looking at a conglomerate of pictures drawn using our graphical editor, the picture layout system. Using one of the buttons in the menu at the bottom, we can step through the document page by page. This next page gives me a set of options to choose from. In this case, we assume that I have been assigned to fix a problem with the sonar display. I will opt to run a diagnostic test built into the sonar equipment by picking the test button in the main picture area. Before I can actually run the test, however, I have to perform a setup procedure. I am told how to connect the maintenance or repair kit to the sonar cabinet. I will now go on to run the test. But 
Notice that I could have asked for extra help if I needed more information or could have used the back button, a miniature of the previous page, to review the information I have already seen. To run the test, I pick the Start Test button. You'll notice that we use animation to indicate the passage of time. The built-in diagnostic system indicates to us that there are problems with the system hardware. This page tells me how to proceed to run further tests and how to fix the problem. If I now want to travel non-sequentially through the document, I can pick a number of options. If I hit the manual button, I'm given a group of non-sequential travel facilities. The timeline button will display my progress through the document, providing me with an easy way to go back in time to any of the pages I've already seen during the session. The date and time I visited each page are indicated just below the miniatures of the pages. Steve, are you still on? I guess we lost him. I just want to mention about Steve. Still there. Oh, you're still there. Yes, uh, you can hear me, right? He's gone on in the world of maintenance and repair. He's a distinguished professor at University of Columbia, Columbia University, rather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very different. Sorry yes. about that. And he's a world expert in AR and VR. Thanks very much for helping us out. Thanks, Thank Steve. You. You're very welcome. Yes, I wish I could be there. Very frustrating not being there. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Back to you, Norm. Yeah, so now we waited till the end to put up the slides to congratulate um, and honor the people who did all this work. So if you did this and you'd like, you can stand up and get your applause. And if we're missing... <laughs> Over the past couple of weeks, thanks to Norm and others, we've been doing this archaeological dig. Part of it is trying to, in our memories, reconstruct who might have worked on these projects. We probably left out people. If you remember them, come up to us so that we can enrich our history of these projects. So here are the press folks. <laughs> here are the poetry folks. Yeah. And before lunch, here's a tribute to those who aren't with us anymore. <coughs> One of the original 11 at Microsoft. Well, it's nice to see all those faces, even though they're not with us, so we'll give them a round of applause. And now we have lunch in the lobby. You can eat outside or in room 115, and in room 115 is uh, some demos of Intermedia and Fress and Hypertext Hotel VR.